Okay, thank you everyone so much um, for joining. Um, my name is Adina Pupko from the Natan Funds, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's discussion about Latin American Jewish food. As always, we're so appreciative of you joining us here. This is the third and final discussion in a series of events around the spring 2020 Natan Notable Books winner, The Seventh Heaven, travels through Jewish Latin America by Ilan Funds and is being sponsored by the Jewish Book Council, Natan Funds, and the Jewish Food Society. To hear about today's discussion speakers, but first let me just say a few words about Natan and Natan Notable. The Seventh Heaven joins a growing list of distinguished works like Barry Wells' How to Fight Anti-Semitism, Mati Friedman's Spies of No Country, Susie Linfield's In the Lion's Den, and Ari Shavit's My Promised Land. Natan is a venture philanthropy fund and a giving circle. Our members invest their philanthropic dollars in cutting edge emerging nonprofit organizations in Israel and in Jewish communities around the world as a way of engaging more people in Jewish life, helping communities innovate and adapt to new opportunities and challenges, and building a strong state of business and connecting people to it in authentic and meaningful ways. Usually we do this through giving to nonprofit organizations, but a few years ago we branched out into the world of brand ideas by creating a book award in partnership with the Jewish Book Council. Twice a year, Natan Noble Books recognizes recently published or soon to be published nonfiction books that promise to catalyze conversations aligned with the themes of Natan's grant making. Professor Stevans's beautiful book brings the conversation of Jewish identity outside the borders of North American Israel, introducing readers to Jewish immigrants, cultures, traditions, and communities across Latin America. Our goal is to catalyze conversations about the diversity of the Jewish people, especially at a time when diversity is very much part of public conversation, and to highlight the ever-evolving experiences of Jews in different parts of the world with their neighbors. Today's conversation allows us to dive into everyone's favorite theme, food. The first two events were about immigration and anti-Semitism. So while vitally important, this might be a little more fun. Um, and with that, I'm passing it over to Amanda Dell from the Jewish Food Society. Thanks, Adina. I love, I love getting introduced under the premise of fun. Um, <laughs> and it's really, it's such a pleasure to be here um, today. I want to just say a big thanks to Natan and the Jewish Book Council for hosting today's event. And of course, to our guests, Ilan and Patty. So incredibly excited to learn and listen to this conversation. Um, as Adina mentioned, my name is Amanda Dell. I'm the program director of Jewish Food Society. We are a nonprofit organization that works to preserve, celebrate, and revitalize Jewish culinary heritage from all around the world. Since 2017, we've been building an online archive of family recipes and the histories behind them. And then in order to really bring that archive to life, we host all sorts of dynamic public programs. Um, thinking back to a few years ago, we had the honor to collaborate with Chef Patty Janich on a Mexican Jewish Passover Seder at the James Beard Foundation. Um, thinking back to the menu, like at first glance, it kind of seems like just the classics that we've come to expect. But after a closer look, we see that the matzo ball soup has fresh lime and cilantro, the haroset has orange juice, and the gefilte fish, Veracruz style, is made with tomatoes, olives, and pickled peppers. Um, I've made it, and you'll definitely never want to make gefilte fish another way again. <laughs> um, if you want a taste of that night and many other Latin Jewish recipes from Cuba, Brazil, Buenos Aires, I invite you to visit jewishfoodsociety.org and, and check them out, as well as the family histories behind these recipes. Um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Miriam from Jewish Book Council to begin. And again, we're just really thrilled and honored to be here and, and to learn from Patty and Elon today. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm Mary Pomerantz Dauber from Jewish Book Council. Our mission at Jewish Book Council is to educate, enrich, and strengthen the community through Jewish literature. Visit jewishbookcouncil.org to learn about JBC's reviews, essays, literary journal, which will be out very soon, Paper Brigade, our book club resources, author tours, and our literary awards. I hope you'll check out all of our programs and resources. A word of thanks to our panelists, Patty Janich and Ilan Stavans. We're looking forward to learning from you and to our audience. We hope you'll support today's authors by purchasing a copy of their books using the links in our chat. And thank you to our partners at Natan Fund and Jewish Food Society. To introduce our panelists, internationally renowned essayist, translator, editor, and teacher, Ilan Stavans, is the Louis Sebring Professor of Humanities, Latin American and Latino Culture 
at Amherst College, the publisher of Restless Books, and the host of the NPR con podcast, In Contrast. His many books include, and working in Jewish books, I can tell you many, many books, include the Oxford Book of Jewish Stories, the memoir On Borrowed Words, Spanglish, The Making of a New American Language, the three-volume set of Isaac Basheva Singer, The Collected Stories, The Shotgun Book of Modern Sephardic Literature, The Norton Anthology of Latino Literature, Quixote, The Novel and the World, The Seventh Heaven Travels Through Jewish Latin America, and How Yiddish Changed America and How America Changed Yiddish. The recipient of numerous prizes, his work, translated into 15 languages, has been adapted into film, TV, theater, and radio. Patty Janik is the host of the PBS television series, Patty's Mexican Table, now in its ninth season, named one of the 100 greatest cooks of all time by Epicurious and Bon Appetit. She has won three James Beard Awards and a Gracie Award for her television work, and is a three-time Emmy and IACP Award nominee. A former political analyst, she's a resident chef of the Mexican Cultural Institute and has appeared on NPR's Splendid Table and All Things Considered. NBC's Today, CBS's The Talk, ABC's Good Morning America, and Food Network. Born and raised in Mexico City, she lives in Chevy Chase, Maryland with her husband and three boys. So, Elon and Patty, we all know what we think of, for many of us, when we think of Jewish food, and we know what we think of when we think of Mexican food. So tell us a little bit, what is Mexican Jewish food? Patty, you go first. Yeah, I was going to say, I need to let Ilan speak first. And I want to just tell everybody how in awe I am that I'm in a conversation with Ilan because I've been a fan for like so long and I've read all his things and I'm just totally starstruck right now. So you go. <laughs> <laughs> Muchísimas gracias, Patty. And, and it's, uh, the feeling is mutual. I've been a follower of yours. I want to thank all the hosts, uh, host institutions for bringing us all together, uh, the Jewish Book Council and the Natan Award and the, and the Jewish food. Uh, Miriam, in response to your question, I, I like to pose even a larger question. What is Jewish food? Jewish food is often the food that Jews produce in different diasporas. Um, they, we have a, an astonishing capacity to absorb from the environment, to learn and to incorporate or incorporate elements uh, that uh, are part of that national or cultural background. But then we reinvent them. We pose uh, new elements and we season them anew. Um, and I think Mexican Jewish food is exactly that, is the arrival of immigrants that have been coming to Mexico from the colonial period, the crypto Jews, the new Christians, uh, who came from 1492 to the age of independence in 1810 and who arrived with a particular taste and flavor and approach. Some of them needed to be secretly committed to the Jewish faith. And so they openly pretended that they would eat pork, but in, at home they would eat fish, they would eat lamb, they would eat chicken, they would eat beef, they would separate milchik and fleshik. Uh, then there are two successive immigrations that happen at the end of the 19th century. The Sephardic immigration or the Ottoman immigration that comes from the region of the Balkans, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, the former Yugoslavia, and that arrives to Mexico with an astonishing cuisine that is a mix of uh, what had, what had uh, been pushed forward from Spain and uh, had been incorporated into all those regions. And uh, in that cuisine in and of itself is extraordinarily rich as well. It is, it is made of pomegranates and, and pears and beans and uh, lentils. And, and the other immigrant in a uh, wave that happens at that time is the Yiddish speaking uh, one from the Pale of Settlement, Gifil with the fish, uh, herring, uh, rugelach, bagels. And so Mexican Jewish food is the sum of the various immigrant groups that have arrived. And with, with wonderful chefs like Patty, it has been a, a result of fusion where the tastes that you have from the immigrants are now reconsidered with the wonderfully 
rich array of Mexican foods that, uh, you know, it's price winning and internationally known. But I throw it back to you, Patti. <laughs> no, I think uh, what you're saying is, is exactly um, what I think a lot of people don't know when people ask me, is there such a thing as Mexican Jewish food? And they think that just throwing a jalapeno into a pot makes it Mexican. But really the interweaving of the different um, Jewish immigration waves into Mexico um, and throughout Mexican history has made a very solid Mexican Jewish cuisine that, as you say, mm -hmm. has been in the making since the Marranos got on the boats um, in the conquest. And they, you know, even Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, who loved to side with the downtrodden, used to say that they had Jewish roots. And you have a lot of people that hid their roots, a lot of people that are now, you know, finding out that their great, 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 great grandparents um, was a Jew. And you have all these immigrant waves. And the fascinating thing, I think, in Mexican Jewish cooking is, well, first of all, I'm very grateful that it's gefilte fish a la veracruzana because you do not need an acquired taste to eat that kind of gefilte fish. You know, having grown up with the white gefilte fish and the pechay, you know, the chicken's food jelly with crane on top, and it's things that you love because you grow up loving. So you have this core, this soul of Jewish foods that move with the Jews, no matter where the Jews move throughout the world. But it's not just simple. It's not only dimensional because you have the Ashkenazi from the Eastern cold countries, like my Polish grandparents who only knew how to eat schmaltz and boiled potatoes and um, stuffed kisnecks with bread, you know? Uh, but then you have the very rich traditions from the Sephardic and the Lebanese and the Syrian. And the fascinating thing in Mexico is very different from Argentina. And again, it's so great to break myths and diversify. The Jewish community in Mexico is very divided. You know, you have the Ashkenazi, you have the Sephardic, and the Sephardic are also divided between a Halevi and Shami. And many times it's considered an intermarriage when the Ashkenazi, like my sister, married a Shami. It was like, oh, she's never going to learn our cooking and eating ways. She had to cook with the grandmother, you know, many Fridays to learn how to make kipe, which we didn't grow up with. So I think it's a fascinating universe to dive into that's very rich and that keeps on evolving, as, as you say, and that... You know, there are classic staples of the Jewish Mexican cuisine, uh, both in the Ashkenazi world and the Sephardic and Turkish world. And, and it is something that keeps on evolving. And I think we see it in our grandparents' kitchens, how I think the, the history of the Mexican Jews is a happy, warm one. You know, overall, the Mexican Jewish community has been able to build a strong, constructive relationship with the government and with the country and Mexican Jews feel like Mexico is their home and they've grown roots and and one of the ways that you see it is in the interweaving of the foods in the kitchen so thank god for the gefilte fish a la veracruzana thank god for the tortillas with guacamole and grievenes on top you know yes I you know what's what's a year Patty, uh, in Hanukkah here in Amherst where I live uh, with my uh -huh. wife and kids we have a Hanukkah party where we invite, uh, I don't know, uh, 40, 50 people and uh, we make latkes and we put mole. Uh, the mole really makes uh, for a delicious addition and a fusion. You can also put the, the sour cream, you can put the, the applesauce, but the latkes with mole have really become legendary around here. And I think in many ways that is the, the kind of the Latino aspect of Jewish life or the Jewish aspect of Latino life that uh, makes for those two halves of who we are to come together, two hemispheres that become one. I agree. And I also, oh my God, I love the idea of latkes with mole. Um, and, and another thing that I think is a very happy coincidence, you know, is how much the Mexican traditions and the Jewish traditions are similar in things that have to do around the table. If you think about the stereotype of a Mexican mom and a Jewish mom, 
They're yeah, both so obsessed good. with stuffing their children until they can't eat no more. I always joke that the combination of being a Mexican and a Jewish mom is like a Woody Allen-esque caricature where I would feed my kids and then take them for a walk so they would get hungry again, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and now that, um, even now that uh, my my kids are older, my oldest son is now in college and nothing makes me happier than when he texts me or he's, he's, uh, my middle son Sammy just also finished high school and he just left, that's why I'm in denial. But when they text me and they send me images of the food they're eating, but mostly when they ask me for recipes of things they grew up eating at home, yeah. is we connect through food. And I think the Mexican and the Jewish character in the sobremesa, Jews are the same as Mexicans. We stay, we linger at the table. And so I think there's so many things that made for the intermarriage of the Mexican and Jewish culture uh, be so complete and happy and welcoming and nurturing. And I would say maternal, but I'm a woman. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to come in or? Okay, uh, sure. So I was going to say, you know, Patty, as you mentioned, gefilte fish is an acquired taste for many people. Are there any um, controversial foods that you would consider a part of a Mexican Jewish cuisine that either from a Sephardi or Ashkenazi perspective don't go across at all or that people who are not used to um, Jewish Mexican cuisine um, would be surprised by. Um, you know, there are all those YouTube videos of people who have never tasted jarred gefilte fish being handed a plate and, and what happens next. <laughs> I mean, I think, again, like one of the similarities between the Jewish cuisine and the Mexican cuisine is how nose to tail we are. You know, if you think about the Mexican cooking traditions, um, and here I'm gonna talk about pigs, you know, we eat pigs, pigs ears, pigs tails, pigs chicharron, etc. Of course, there's that grating in the Mexican Jewish community. There's the very kosher, and then there's the very light. But even in the Jewish tradition, you know, when we when we eat an animal, when you eat a chicken, when you eat a goat, you eat everything of the animal. You're really honoring that blessing of, you know, um, you're not gonna put any of that life to waste. And that goes in the chant that goes in, I remember the chant my grandmother used to make, which was like the stuffed chicken necks with with bread and with um, liver and with um, sweetbreads. And so I think there's, there's that going for it too. I think just like you need an acquired taste to eat gefilte fish from a jar, or I mean, quite frankly, even the homemade just white gefilte fish. I love it, but if I didn't know it, I wouldn't want to eat it. Um, and so I think there's the same thing in Mexican cooking. Uh, and I think those things really come together beautifully. One of the great aspects of the Mexican cooking, in my view, Patti, is the versatility of the breakfast uh, uh, menu. Um, a big breakfast, a hefty breakfast, a complete breakfast is as Mexican as I think the charros or mariachis. And one of the beautiful things that has happened in the Jewish Mexican dialogue is the way, you know, for instance, I have had chilaquiles that are made in particular ways with matzo, which could be connected in, 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 a, in some fashion with matzo braai, but really taste much more like chilaquiles. Uh, the, the way you would cook certain eggs and accompany it with arenque, with herring, but then you put a little salsa or mole, or you put mango uh, next to it. Uh, I guess it's, it's also the colors. You were talking about the, the, the presence of what happens around the table. And to me, it's the lush uh, uh, fiesta of colors uh, that a Mexican Jewish table has. You feel that with all that uh, creativity that people just begin to laugh and it's because there's going to be 
a quick contrast of flavors, the sour and the sweet, the, the, the extreme spiciness with the lighthearted one. Mexican food is very much like Mexicans. It doesn't hold any hostages. It goes straight into the, the opposites. And it is how you connect the opposites. It's how you play with the point and counterpoint that makes you a good chef, a lasting chef, and, and that will entertain those that, that come to your house. Oh my gosh, and the inventiveness. Um, and I think that, you know, thinking here, for example, my, my three sisters, I have three older sisters, we're all in the world of food, and my oldest sister opened a restaurant in Mexico City a couple of years ago, it's called Nido, and she makes like, um, homey food, you know, just um, comida, uh, comida casera, like family style food where she, where she connects like the Mexican and the Jewish. And in, in about what Ilan was talking, um, she makes shakshuka chilaquiles. Oh. And they are the, the biggest success of her restaurant. So she has the tortilla chips, but she serves them in a shakshuka sauce. And she dresses it with the labne cheese, with a little bit of tahine, and um and some yeah. sata, you know yeah. and so the the wonderful thing is that you know for a cuisine to continue to evolve and be rich and be alive and grow it really needs new air it needs inventiveness and i think both mexicans and jewish have that and when you combine the mexican and the jew both Mexicans and Jews and the combination um, really honor the past and are um, in love with their legends and tradition. May they be true or not true, you know, legends, traditions, rights, we love them. You know, it, it doesn't have to do with how religious you are. You may be very religious or not, but we love those roots and those traditions and we honor what we've inherited. But at the same time, there's this hunger for inventiveness and for new yeah. things. And I think that's what keeps the Mexican um, Jewish cuisine so fascinating that every time I go back to Mexico, I'll tell you, I mean, and I write cookbooks and I like my cookbooks, but there's nothing like the Jewish community cookbooks. They <laughs> are the most fascinating thing because you see, you know, how the, the, the families keep on evolving the Mexican and the Jew, like to no end. You know, there's like, you know how in Mexico we like um, the Mexican style sushi, which I'm sure um, Japanese people would really be horrified and run away because in the typical Mexican <laughs> sushi, we put cream cheese, avocado, um, surimi with like jalapenos and spicy sauce. And then mm. we put that in so, you know, you've had that. Oh, I um, love it. I love that. We dip the, <laughs> the sushi in, um, in chiles toreados. Okay. Puta. So like Mexican Jews, like for Friday night, we'll do a sushi cake. So in a mold, they'll do the sushi with the surimi and the layers of avocado and cream cheese. Oh. It's just like making it over the top. So is that Mexican? Is that Jewish? Is that Japanese? Is that what is it? But it's part of the repertoire. It, and in that repertoire, I think it's so important what you're saying, uh, Patty, because um, I have two two thoughts. The first one is that not long ago, my mother sent me on a PDF uh, the the cookbook that my grandmother Bob and Miriam had prepared, had used for years. It has Yiddish and Hebrew and Spanish in all sorts of words crossed out and the date that she did this. And you can see the layers of immigration that happen in a Jewish family. When you choose the immigrant, it is the first, she's learning Spanish as she is cooking. You can see the confluence of languages over there. You can see how she is loyal to the food that she came with, but at the same time, she is cooking different types of things that she is being exposed for the first time. And my second thought is that in reaction, there is another wave that I think of immigration that is very important in Mexico, and that is the Israelis that have come from, of course, from, from the Middle East, from other parts of the world, and have settled in Mexico, Mexico City, 
Guadalajara, Monterrey, and have brought with them a new type of fusion Middle Eastern cuisine that the Mexican Jews themselves have incorporated. So when you say shakshuka, uh, with, in, 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 uh, prepared in different ways. It could be the shakshuka that the Sephardim brought together from Turkey, but it could also be the shakshuka that is being used right now in the, in, in the Middle East and has been brought by, by this new wave of, of, of Israelis. And I, what I love is that you can see the history, the history of the, of the many different arrivals and departures all happening as if it was a, a living museum in front of you with all those things. That is fascinating. And then you also have the Argentinian wave, right? Yes, yes. Well, I, I think that the whole thing of Latin American Jewish food is something that uh, I have been exploring as of late. I, the, the five years that I spent in Latin America traveling Jewish communities and visiting a, you know, communities isolated in the Amazons, different uh, smaller cities, uh, crypto Jews, uh, Sephardim activistas. It has really taught me that each country has that type of fusion in Peru. There is a Peruvian Jewish food that very much incorporates the, the flavors in, in, in Lima that are very different to the flavors on the coast. Argentina, which is the biggest center of Jewish life in Latin America, has a pastrami, they call it postron. Uh, you can have tacos of pastrami, which is Mexican Jewish Argentine food. They have the asado, they have the rugelach that they have ad adapted themselves. There is a plethora of possibilities of Latin American Jewish food that I think in and of the themselves is like a, like a tunnel that, that makes you travel through the different histories, national histories, in the struggles and the triumphs, the tribulations of many of the immigrants that settle in those countries and acquire the profile of those particular regions. Yeah, oh my gosh, that is fascinating. I know I'm interrupting here, but I, um, I just think that this is, uh, it's amazing that you, you wrote this book and that you deal with these topics because I think this is a theme that is really unknown. People don't know how rich and diverse the Latin Jewish community is, both south of the U.S. border and north of the border, because you yes. also find um, Colombian Jews in Miami and Argentinian Jews here in D.C. And I think there is, it may be fascinating to see what the common denominator is. But I'm thinking about, I used to be really good at math when I was a political analyst, but that was 20 years ago. Um, what the common denominator is for all Latin Jews, you know, mm -hmm. and, then, and then what sets them apart. And of course, there's this evolution. And the wonderful thing about being in the world of food is that you can eat that history, right? You can yeah. taste how it's changed. And I think it's very easy to in hindsight, criticize a food that existed 50 years ago. Uh, but I think we, we forget that we're judging something with today's lens. Um, well, I have a question for you, Patty. Um, you were talking about your sister's restaurant in Mexico, in Mexico and uh, the, the various Jewish restaurants that I have found in Buenos Aires, in Bogota, in Sao Paulo. One thing that I haven't found, and I want to ask you why, is a Jewish Latin American restaurant in the United States. I, I, can see, I can see Argentinian food or Brazilian food, but do you think at any point soon, have I missed something? And that is not only part of the menu, but that the profile of the restaurant is Jewish and Latino or Latin American. Are we prepared for that? And if we are not, why not? What, what's happening there? This is such a great question. And I think there have been, this is a thing. When, when people connect Jewish and Latin in food, I think people tend to immediately go to kosher. Yeah. Um, and of course, part of the heart of how Mexican or Argentinian or whatever Jewish food has evolved, it's because at the heart, we have those kashrut laws and all the rules that have made our food our food, whether you're kosher or not. And I think there's a divide there um, between having to have, a, I mean, I'll tell you, I've sometimes cooked for events 
that are kosher and when you're not kosher. It's complicated. Um, and so I think there's there's that thing that makes it like one obstacle or a, a complication to consider in terms of, and here I'm thinking like in a restaurateur mind, like it permits, um, ingredients are much more expensive when they're kosher, rules are complicated, how many things refrigerators you need to have, like do you do one style or another style? So I think, um, would there be, I've been asked many times, Ilan, why don't you write a Mexican Jewish cookbook? Yes, what's the answer? And I always say, <laughs> because I love Mexican Jewish food and I'd love to do it, but there's this insecurity, I guess, in oh, that. Oh, no, that, I have to. In that, in that so I am. Put it aside. Not, not insecurity, but um, feeling like I am not. I don't have the tools to write a Mexican Jewish cookbook because I'm not kosher and I did not grow up kosher. And I think the expectation is that if you are going to write a Mexican Jewish cookbook, you need to know all the rules because that's the standard. Your book needs to be, if it's going to be a Mexican Jewish cook, it has to be kosher because you can't make a Mexican Jewish cookbook that has kind of the equivalent of the, of the kosher Chinese. That, uh, that people would have. Like, can we, can we liberate, liberate us? I guess this is an existential question. <laughs> can we liberate ourselves from having to do a kosher or should we all do a kosher? Or if you do a Mexican- No, but I think you can do a hybrid. A you can do a section of the book that is kosher foods and then it goes by festivals or it goes by, by daily, daily meals. And then you have a section that says, you know, this is for the secular, the non-religious. <laughs> For, for those who are ready to eat uh, pork in any way. Right. But then I think that people that, the, the, you know, it's, you're never going to, people are just not going to be happy in one way or another. And but the that's a Jewish condition. Anyhow, even if you only did it for kash kashrut, people are going to complain in one way or another. It's <laughs> true. <the> business. true. <laughs> but in, terms, in terms of the flavors, oh my gosh, yes, please. You know, to give you an example, and not only... Um, the Ashkenazi, the Jewish Ashkenazi Mexican cooking, because we've talked about the gefilte fish and the soups and the tzimes, you know, my grandmother used to make these tzimes with prunes and carrots and then add a little bit of chipotle to that. It's just incredible. But um, when you think about the Sephardic Jewish cooking, for example, I forget the name now, but they have, and I say they because I'm Ashkenazi, um, the pita bread that you top with the ground lamb that's seasoned with tons of spices and bell pepper and parsley. And in Mexico, they add tamarind and ancho chile. Oh. And then you have that pita bread that's open with that um, like lamb, like ground lamb seasoned, wet, moist, like chile rub meat. You put it in the oven. Think of a like Sephardic Mexican style pizza, you take it out and then you eat it with guacamole and tahine. And it is ridiculous. Or I remember in Mexico, there used to be a taqueria that they closed and where they, they used to have like al pastor style tacos, but of course not with pork, with chicken. And again, you ate it with, with a soft pita bread and like a spicy chipotle uh, sauce and then like a tahine preparado with, you know, how we do the prepared sauces with lime juice, soy, um, salsa inglesa, maggi. You know, I, I discovered in, in, in doing this, the, this five year trip through Jewish Latin America, that the, the taco al pastor that is so essential. And for people who are listening to us, the taco al pastor is the, is the, is meat, it's, it's, it's it, no, it's pork, ¿qué es? Es, es puerco? Es puerco, sí. Es puerco. It's, it's pork that is a, on a grill that circles around, there's a, there's a, like a fire pit. Like a fire pit, and at the very top, there's this pineapple that you cut, and it's a, it's a dance to eat a, a taco al pastor, because those that are cutting it will put the taco on the, on the, the tortilla on the left side, and then the meat will fly, and the pineapple will fly, but I discovered that actually this very central staple of Mexican food arrived with the Turks and with the Lebanese. With the Lebanese. At the very end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And now everybody, of course, thinks it's Mexican, but it has been brought in by these waves of immigration. Yet again, prove, uh, 
the, the degree to which much of what we eat today is so different from what somebody in 1655 would eat in Mexico or 1780 as, as, as centuries evolved immigrations came, the country found its flavors, its tastes, and also all the richness of, of the outside created a cuisine that is, that is really international while being local at the same time. Absolutely, absolutely. And the fascinating thing is that it keeps on evolving. So every time that I go back, back to Mexico, I'm in awe. Like, I can't keep up, you know? Like, if I have a season of Paris Mexican table where I did Puebla, forget it. It's outdated. I need to do one now, 13 more episodes. Like, and I think that, that's the fascinating thing. And I think that's one of, of the signs of strength when you cannot keep up with a cuisine. It's thriving, it's growing, it's evolving while respecting its roots and honoring what we've inherited. For example, to give you an example, I don't know if you've been to Cuba. You probably have been to Cuba. Yes, yeah. So I remember when I went to Cuba and I had, I had read so much, right, about Cuba and seen so many movies and in Cuban uh, food and sandwiches in Miami and in I remember I went, it was like five years ago, I think, and the food was just so sad. And it is because they have, they had no ingredients. They have no, yeah, so the it's like they were, they were asphyxiated in this like capsula with no source to either update or to renew or to do anything new. Even if you were going to do a classic thing and not evolve, you need to adapt to technology, to new ingredients. Like if you think about like the restaurants that are stale, if you go to Boston and you go to one of those lobster places and they give you the lobster like they served it in 1960, it doesn't taste right anymore. You know, yeah. like things need to be updated and, and, and what happens, what tells you that something is in decay or in trouble is when it tastes like it, it hasn't had air to breathe. And what, in that sense, I think Mexican cuisine and Latin Jewish cuisine has that advantage that because we move so much, it keeps on evolving. But yes, you were saying. I was going to add to that, that there is an element of hope and of resilience. I've been in Cuba, as I mentioned, a, I don't know, dozens of times. And the Cuban Jewish community is especially fascinating to me because of the embargo, because of communism, because of, because of the challenges that uh, the island and the minorities within the island have faced, um, the Jewish community has needed to adapt to the times by having a lot of people that have converted to Judaism. So I was, for instance, in a minyan uh, on Saturday morning or went to Shabbat dinner and I would say out of the 60 people at La Comunidad, uh, maybe 50 were people of color. And I had food that was Jewish Cuban food that had incorporated elements from Afro-Cuban food, stews in, in uh, paprika, etc., cetera, that, that were really delicious. And so in spite of the poverty and the limitations, the fact that within the community there had been trends to bring about other aspects of Cuba have pushed that cuisine into new horizons. And when the reality changes again, I think those different influences are going to enrich ultimately what the, what the Cuban cuisine and Cuban Jewish cuisine are going to be in general. I'm with you. <laughs> so I want to jump in just for a moment because we are getting questions from the audience. Um, we will ask a couple of the questions and then um, we will wrap up from today. So first we have a lot of comments of people who want to know if they can get Mexican community cookbooks. And Patty, they really want you to write a Mexican Jewish cookbook. Yes, of course, <laughs> we do. There's a ton of suggestions uh, about how to do it. and I are going to collaborate on one, right? Oh, ya, ya quedó. Lo hacemos. It's a shirach. Elon, I know you've been collecting recipes for years, so there yes. you go. Um, so people are very excited about that. So um, I'm going to skip over some of those questions um, to say, do you see influences from crypto Jews on Mexican Jewish cuisine, but also on non-Jewish Mexican food? 
Have there been influences from Jewish Mexican food that have made it out of the community? You know, deli here is started out as bagels, things like that, that have sort of migrated out of the community. Uh, let me let me let me have a stab at that uh, comment, and then Patty, you take it from there. Uh, I find the life of the crypto Jews to be absolutely extraordinary. Uh, they needed to keep uh, loyal to their identity while, while at the same time protecting uh, their survival. And uh, there are all sorts of cuisine strategies that allowed them to keep connected with the high holidays, with the Shabbat, um, and pretend in the eyes of others to be uh, Christians publicly, but Jewish privately. There are a couple of uh, cookbooks. There is a wonderful cookbook that was prepared by David Kitlitz called, called A Dripple of Honey, that is a, 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 a recetario, a, a, a recipe book of all the different dishes that the crypto Jews had, mainly in Spain, but also in Mexico and Peru, the, the two main centers. There are a todo tipo de cebadas y de granos, and I'm switching to Spanish, so sorry. A, grains and salads. I don't know if I would talk, Patty will know better about this. I don't know if I would talk about one particular one. There's paellas that they made that were very Jewish, that were kind of jumping out of the Jewish community into the larger landscape. It's a, it's a wonderful history and a little known history, even to other members of the Jewish community in Mexico. But I throw it to you, Patty. No, I, I totally agree in, in the fact that the Jewish community and the Jewish food um, have been of huge influence. I have a, a close example. So one of my grandmothers came from Austria and she was fleeing the Holocaust and she, like all of her family died in concentration camps except her. She was sent to New York, couldn't get there, made it to Mexico. And then she found a sister that survived um, Auschwitz. And she found her through the Red Cross. She was able to bring her sister to Mexico. And after like a year of recovery, uh, my great aunt Annie was the first person to open an Austrian bakery. And she started in Mexico City and then she took it to Acapulco. So imagine from being in a concentration camp two years in the Red Amazing. Cross almost dying, then she had her bakery in, in Acapulco and she came and she brought with her all of those Austrian and in many cases Austrian Jewish pastries and cakes, the linzer, the sacher torte, the apple strudel, the all the cookies the she used to make these like dried apricots um, that were covered in a kind of a mashed potato thing. It was like a savory sweet concoction. Um, but I think Jews have brought so much flavor um, into the Latin worlds that they walked into. But at the same time, it's like Jews, depending on where they came from, if it's from Austria, you brought that. But if you were from Poland, from a Stettel, like my paternal grandparents, they just loved a fascination for anything that wasn't boiled potato. So to give you an example, my, my grandfather used to eat a white onion as if it were an apple. I mean, so for him, the existence of avocado, I mean, it, like how much the Jews have given to the world and how much the world gives to Jewish cuisine is really a beautiful, um, balanced thing, I think. So if you go to Mexico, I'm sure, Ilan, you've tried, there used to be this um, a, a Lebanese Arab restaurant called Adonis, not Jewish, yes, yes, Lebanese. Yes, yes. Did you ever go? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh, the, the like, uh, what do you call, like the raw kibe? Yeah. then dressed with the pico de gallo and in with guacamole. And then you have that that um, intersection, right? Because you have Lebanese Jews, but then you have the Lebanese community that's not Jewish. That's the one responsible for the tacos al pastor, for the tacos árabes in Puebla. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a fascinating, never-ending 
a universe which may be frustrating to some because you think you have it down and then new and dishes then real. Up. By the way, Pati, you know, there's a character, there's a moment in, in Don Quixote where a character eats a raw onion and he is told that uh, he will live many, many years. So there, there must be, and, and you know, there's, there's uh, suggestions that uh, the Cervantes, we don't have any proof, might have come from a new Christian family. Uh, maybe the first line in a place of La Mancha, which name I don't, I, I don't want to remember, is a sign that he didn't want to point to origins because he was escaping from origins. As oh. Were. So I, just as an example of this cross-fertilizing effort of the onion and the, and the roots of a, new Christians and Jews and those that were open about it and hiding it. That is Sorry, I have yes. a question here. We have someone who says apparently there's a Mexican Jewish bakery in Chicago called Masa Madre. Um, yeah. Okay. So, and then someone also asked, is challah still challah? Does it change? Have there been any influences that, have sh that you see in challah um, in across Latin American Jewish cuisine or Mexican Jewish? I will start here and you go, Pati, again, because you will. I can tell you that in traveling through this, 20 different republics for five years and visiting Jews in the most extreme circumstances, I found how. You can talk about differences. I can, form, I can talk about unity. And the fact that, that was, there was hala on Friday night was a sign to me of an attempt at endurance and uniformity. They were going to celebrate the, the Shabbat and they were accompanied by this bread that has been with them for generations. I love that. I love that. Yes, um, I would say it's actually fascinating. Um, in Mexico, you find jala that's made with canela, with Mexican chocolate, with piloncillo. But just like that, there's, um, this is interesting. There's a Jewish bakery, and I'm forgetting the name now, but it's a very famous Jewish bakery. Um, and I know in Mexico City, yeah, and, and they are known for not only making like Jewish baked goods and serving bar mitzvahs and weddings, etc., but they're the one of the most requested um mm -hmm. Rosca de Reyes of the city. No, it's uh, and, Teifeld. Uh, dime el nombre, Teifeld? maybe, no. yeah, maybe. No? I don't that know. That was a legendary I, one in the age of, in the generation still, of my mother. Is it, still, and, uh, is it still open? I think it's still open. I think. This I think one is still open. open. Yeah. So they make, they make La Rosca de Reyes and mm -hmm. they stuff it con crema chantilly. Mm. Um, so it's delicious. But when you think about it, this, this is a Jewish kosher bakery making Rosca de Reyes with baby Jesus in it. Yeah. You know, it's just so fascinating. It's perfectly and all Jewish. Nice. It's perfectly Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. And we're going to ask just one more question for today. We haven't gotten to all the questions. Um, we will hopefully be able to send them to Patty and to Ilan after the event. Um, so the last question I'm going to ask is, what would you say the reason why, similar to the United States here, Mexican Jewish restaurants and food sources trend toward the Middle Eastern Israeli style, while Ashkenazi and Sephardic styles are more reserved for home, home cooking? Hmm. Okay, can I jump in here and say, okay, what is likely to be more successful commercially? Like a tongue taco? <laughs> a <sauerkraut>? <laughs> <laughs> or a frappe with chipotle sauce, you know. <laughs> you just, I think. I, um, I, there's, I would add. I would respond also, uh, Miri, with a non-cuisine uh, connected uh, anecdote from my own life. Uh, many of my uh, grandparents and parents have Yiddish names: Abremele, Yosele, Shimele, Toivele, uh, Gitele. Uh, I am the first generation that switched from Yiddish names to Israeli names. Siblings are Liora and Orly and Eitan and so on. There was a move at one point by the Jewish community, even by the Ashkenazi community, 
to leave behind the diasporic vision of Yiddish and to embrace the more Israeli look of what the future was. And I think that today there's a type of nostalgia for that cuisine and for that period and the desire to fuse it, to, 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 uh, to recreate it. Yeah. So I, I totally understand the question. I think it's a complicated answer that it would, that it would beg in that it is rooted in moments in the Mexican Jewish community where it wanted to go beyond a certain past and embrace a new future and now a desire to look back and reappropriate something that was there. Great, thank you. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much to our amazing panelists for your time and energy and expertise. You don't know it, but we are going to write that cookbook together. Encantado. Encantado. Hablemos pronto. We'll, we'll connect. <laughs> we'll make it happen. Um, we, it was all delicious. I'm hungry. I'd like to go have I'm fun. <laughs> um, Elon, people want your mole recipe. And Patty, we want to see that cookbook. If you would like two of Patty's recipes, including one for the gefilte fish a la vera cruzana, you can find the link in the chat. And if you missed part of today's conversation or either of the previous two events, they'll be available for viewing on the Jewish Book Council Facebook page. Again, you can see the link in the chat. Additionally, I do know that there were some questions we didn't get to today and many more from our previous conversations. So we've asked our panel, Ilan and, um, our, and Patty and previous um, panelists to address some of them. And those answers will be shared on the blog on the Jewish Book Council website in coming weeks. Thank you so much to our audience and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Hasta luego. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>